Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest podcast. I am Eric Kane with Rob Lewis, Brent Hubbs, and Austin Price. Fall camp is well underway. We couldn't do this coverage for the VolQuest podcast, Austin Price, without our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. No doubt about it. Jeff, Dustin, those, those guys do a great job. Uh, very personable. Love to interact with the community. They're big into the community. Um, you know, so give those guys a call and, and get an estimate. You know, they, they do great work on siding, roofs, you name it. They can... It can help improve your home or kind of revitalize it and and uh, kind of take it back to where it once was if it's uh, you know a little bit older. For a free estimate, give them a call today at 865-524-5888 or as always, visit Exterior Home Solutions online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. A lot to talk about here at the beginning of the week. Tennessee is through one week of fall camp. Media Day was last Tuesday. They had four practices. Then you had an off day. Practice yesterday, they're going to practice today and tomorrow, and then scrimmage number one is on Thursday. Brent Hub, some of the highlights so far of Tennessee and fall camp. Well, I, I mean, I think just when you look at this team, um, athletically they look better, you know. There's no doubt we've talked about that, just running around in shorts and, and shells, you know, what they look like at the linebacker position. And, um, you know, I think this defensive line has, has played well to start fall camp here. We'll see how the offensive line responds. I think it's too early to push panic buttons. Uh, But I think it's clear, Austin, right now, the defensive line is ahead of the offensive line. I don't think that's a shock. I don't think that's a big surprise to everybody right now. Maybe the surprise is that some of those young defensive linemen have been a little better out of the gate maybe than you thought. Uh, But, but, you know, this is a big week for this offensive line. Uh, Glenn Ellerby spoke on Monday. They don't have to have all the answers at the end of this week. But they've got to start to move to, to find some answers at, at tackle and guard and backup center. Yeah, 100. percent I mean, you know, again, I, I said on the two minute drill, I would expect that the, the defensive line to make plenty of plays against the offensive line in these first handful of scrimmages. It doesn't mean that the offensive line is awful. It could just simply mean the defensive line is better than some thought and have developed nicely, and the young guys have come ready to play sooner uh, than most, you know, maybe thought coming in. You know, I, I just think there's a lot of unknown up front of the offensive line. And, um, you know, even guys with like John Campbell, I mean, sure, you'd love to say, oh, you plug and play, right? You know, but I think there's some unknown there playing from the ACC to the SEC. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, kind of the – you think you know what you have with Cooper and Spraggs, but at the same time, they're not beside Darnell and, and you know, Jerome Carvin. So how does that affect those players? Because it does – have an effect at times when the guy to your right or to your left is no longer there. Yeah, and it feels like to me, Eric, that that Jerome Carvin probably did not get enough credit a year year ago. I mean, Darnell Wright was fantastic, and we know that. Um, But but Carvin was steady Eddie. Um, Was he a dominating player? No, but, boy, he was really solid and really good, and you knew what you were getting from him every single snap and every single day. So, um, you know, probably haven't talked as much about the loss of him compared to the loss of Wright uh, and what that means for Tennessee. So we'll, we'll see where where they are. Uh, on the flip side, uh, Rob, defensive line-wise, Rodney Garner's got a lot of bodies, and uh, he's got a lot of proven bodies in there that that gives him, you know, a lot to work with on the uh, on the defensive interior in particular. Maybe not a superstar for, for, for Rodney, but I mean, Omar Thomas is, I think, a really high level SEC player. Um, you know, Bryson Eason played a lot of football. Um, you know, I, I just think you have to feel good about the depth. And I know this is something you, you've talked about a lot, Hubbard, written about, about kind of, I, I guess, Rodney maybe forcing himself to play so many guys last year. And, you know, maybe, I, I, I don't know, say before they were ready, but maybe when there was a kind of a drop off between, you know, who was, at the top of the rotation, the bottom, but it's really, it really paid off and it paid off towards the end of last year. And, and I think it's really helped, you know, with the death right now, where you're talking about a guy like Dominic Bailey, um, you know, who, who has played, played some, got a chance last year, Tyree West, you know, they found a way to get him some, some snaps last year as a freshman. So, you know, I, I you know, that unit was really good against the run last year, average against the pass, but I, I think with, with everything that they brought back up front, again, maybe not just a superstar, you know, big time disruptor, but I, I think a very solid group up front. I want to go back to the offensive line here in just a moment, but on the defensive line, Brent, you mentioned some younger guys. 
and Austin, you know, whether it's David Hobbs, whether it's Tyree Weathersby, maybe a newcomer like Omar Norman Lott. Omar Norman Lott's going to play, you know, in this group. And of course, it's a big rotation. Uh, but David Hobbs and, and Weathersby, who were not, or Hobbs is here for spring, but of course, he had to sit out. But these guys did not take part in spring, kind of adapting to it a little bit quicker than maybe some of the younger offensive linemen. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that they've done a nice job, um, you know, of kind of, you know, getting themselves ready, um, you know, and, and kind of diving head, head foot, you know, the whole body and, and kind of just immersing themselves in, you know, kind of Coach G's room. And, you know, you look at Bryce and Easton right there, but, you know, the guy I want to talk about and Hubbard is, is Omar Norman Lott. I think that he had a really strong spring, kind of flew under the radar to a degree. I don't think he's going to fly under the radar – in fall camp. I think he's going to be good to go. And again, I do think that the defensive line helps this offensive line because they're going to be able to kind of see, okay, we are really, really coming up short in this particular area. We've got to be better here and there. Now it's up to the coaching staff to figure all that out and kind of, you know, you know, kind of fix, you know, maybe the, some of those, those problems. But, you know, I, I think that the defensive line, um, helps this offensive line immensely uh, over the next couple of weeks just because it's not just old guys. It's young guys, too, that are pushing, and, and, and there's a lot of depth there. And I think that the hand in hand, they're going to help each other on both sides of the ball at, at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, Omar Norman, lots of guys, I mean, you still don't even really notice him when you go out there, right? I mean, <laughs> you'd have to remind yourself, you know, did he well, he's on our team. Yeah, you know, but then, but then you hear, you know, talk to people afterwards or, you know, at the end of the week or whatever, and uh, he's done a good job. I mean, he got no notoriety in spring, and you talk to people after spring, they're like, oh, yeah, he had a terrific spring. Um, you know, he, he did really well. And you're like, really? Because, I mean, I, I didn't hear anybody really talk about the guy. And so superstar, probably not, but but a guy who certainly uh, got the physicality that you're looking for and, and seems to ha have adjusted, um, you know, well to this point. Now, again, they haven't scrimmaged yet. Um, Eric, you, you, you're a football guy. You know it changes when you get into thigh pads and full gear and, and when you start stacking days and you get into scrimmages and – and all those things. So um, we'll see. I mean, I, I think there's more encouragement about the defensive line, probably a little more concern right now uh, about the offensive line that, than there is, you know, maybe some other places. But but again, I don't think anybody has, has done a panic job. And for whatever reason, Glenn Ellerby has always been able to put a good offensive line out there to be an effective offense for Josh Heupel. So there's belief, much like the wide receiver position is always going to produce – the history says the offensive line is going to ultimately end up being okay, but but we'll have to see because they are missing a lot of pieces from a lot of vital pieces from last year, a couple of big vital pieces. Yeah, you know, you call it moving day. It's that scrimmage number one. You go in scrimmage, you come back to practice or in the meetings that next morning or afternoon, and you've got position here and you got names jumbled up. It's like, all right, it's moving day. Maybe it's not permanent, but maybe you're practicing with the twos. You go up with the starters or with the ones down the twos, threes up to the two, you know, whatever the case may be. So I don't think it's fair, and, and again, you guys have mentioned this, I don't think it's fair right now to say, well, Tennessee's offensive line sucks. Tennessee can't find a left guard. Uh, Gerald Mincy can't play on the right side. I, I think that's unfair to say right now because, again, you've got to go out there and scrimmage. And, and, and again, <laughs> thigh pads are not in right now. <laughs> Knee pads aren't in. They really haven't gone full speed just yet, but it's no surprise, Austin, that typically early in camp, and Rob, you can add to this, you know, the defense is always ahead of the offense, and Again, with some of those big holes missing, those big pieces from last year's offensive line, it's no surprise. But they got to figure it out in a hurry, like Glenn Ellerby said. Well, they do. And, and Rob, I mean, when you're having to kind of handle Cooper Mays with kid gloves, make sure he is healthy come the start of the season, it puts you in a weird, weird spot. You know, because you're, you're needing to try to improve and figure some things out on the offensive line, but you also need to keep Cooper healthy because so much of your success will be determined by kind of his ability to stay on the field. And so – it's kind of what comes first, chicken or the egg, you know, like you really need kind of Cooper to kind of play in these scrimmages to kind of help, you know, figure out where you're at on the offensive line, but you also need to keep him healthy. So it, it's a kind of a give and take. Man, I I, I I know Hubbard agrees because he's he came up with the bubble wrap comment for Cooper, but I, I, I mean, I would err on the side of caution, you know, completely. I mean, I, I know you can't do that. I mean, you got to play I and mean, it's football, it's a physical game. 
and, and you know, getting the chemistry and cohesion is important. But man, I would again, I, I would be super cautious. But in the same sense, when you're being cautious, when you give a maintenance day, I mean, you've got you got to be able to still get reps. You know, those other guys on the first team O got to be able to go and run some. And when you're rolling snaps or throwing it over the head or can't get some cohesiveness, I mean that, you know, that can be an issue, Brent. Well, it, it is, but it's on those it's on those backup guys to prove that they can play. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's on it's on those guys to show that they can they can take care of business. They, they, they don't have to run it as effectively or as efficiently or as fast as, as Cooper runs it. That's a given, but the simple execution of things has to get cleaned up. And Glenn Ellerby spoke about that on Monday. You know, we talked about, well, we've had some snap issues, which he kind of addressed like that's normal to start spring practice and normal to start fall camp, which I was a little bit surprised by, by that being somewhat of a normal statement. Maybe it's because they're trying to go so fast. But you got to get down for the simple execution, as you mentioned, to allow the other guys to get the reps they need. And, and you've got to take advantage of it. If you're Addison Nichols and you're Vice and Lang, hey, hey, here's, I mean, think about the opportunity you're getting right now, right? They're going to give a maintenance day to the senior. you you got to run because you know that day's coming. I mean, it's not like it's, hey, middle of practice, get in there and go. It's, hey, he's not going on Monday. You need to be ready to go. You need to be at your best. So, um, you know, those guys have to step up. Bison Lang's young and Addison's still learning the position. A again, for first scrimmage, I I've told this story a million times. In, in 94, Peyton Manning couldn't throw a spiral for most of fall camp. He turned out to be a pretty good player. Um, in 98, they didn't score a touchdown in the preseason. Um, they went to Syracuse and scored 34 points, which is the biggest shock to – Anybody that watched that, you know, watched that team in the preseason. I'm not saying this is the 98 team in any way, shape, or form. But what I am saying is you, you got to be cautious and not get too caught up in it right now. But you also got to be real. And what's real is this defensive front is ahead of the offensive front through a week and one practice or a week and two practices as they get ready to head into um, the first scrimmage on Thursday. What I think we can say right now, uh, Rob, is, and again, we're out there for just you know a little over 20 minutes and all that. We get to see routes on air and everything. Joe Milton's looked good in short so far. Um, his, his balls have looked really good, tight spirals, threw the deep ball pretty well. He had one bad throw on, on Monday morning, but overall, I think Joe Milton's looked good. Nico's struggled some, as typical freshmen do early in camp, especially at the position, but he's flashed as well, just like he did in spring. But, Rob, that receiver group, you essentially have four guys who are going to be your starters. There's a lot to love right now early in camp about that receiver group with Dante Thornton, Romel Keaton, of course, Brew McCoy, and Squirrel White. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty strong. I mean, I, I I have a hard time not pumping the hype train to extreme levels for for Dante Thornton. Now, and, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't think we're talking Cordero Hubbard. Do you? I mean, I don't, I don't no. think we're at, at that level. I don't want to. No. I don't want to. Not athletically. No, I don't want to get anybody thinking that but man he he looks different i mean six foot five 210 pounds i mean he can run i mean i mean jamming him seems like a, a losing proposition from you know what we've seen in one-on-ones um and it, it just makes you wonder a little bit how, how he didn't put up bigger numbers in oregon so I'll, I'll be interested to see you know if he just if if he just looks that great on the practice field if it you know doesn't quite translate to saturdays but but man he's He's an impressive specimen. I mean, you know, Brew's a beast. Squirrel is is a fan favorite and, and probably always will be. And and you know, Eric, you wrote it about Ramel Keaton, but just you know, one of the best stories on the team. Just a guy that you know keeps his head down and keeps coming to work and takes advantage of every chance that he gets. And you know, I, I think the young guys look like. I, I, I think Chaz Nimrod's going to have a hard time getting on the field. I mean, just because of what's in front of him. But I, I think he looks like a guy that that has some potential as a freshman. I, I think Leacock. Um, you know, looks the part. So, you know, and, and as, as Hubbard just mentioned about the wideouts with under this staff, I mean, you always think they're going to be productive, but they also look like they've got talent. So to recap, Hubs has got uh, James Pierce uh, looking like Al Wilson, Jalen McCullough looking like Fred White, and Rob, I'm, I'm confused. Is, is, is Dante Thornton part Ronald Davis? Is he part Kenny O'Neill or is he part Jason Swain? Uh, AP, he is going to lead the SEC in, in, in touchdown catches, and Arian Carter is going to lead the SEC in tackles. Is, that, is that correct? Is that... That's, right. That's right. 
<laughs> Ar Ar Arian Carter is the best number seven since Gerard Mayo, and it's not even close that's going to run with that one. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing, I think, back to the receivers, AP, um, about Dante Thornton, the best thing that's happened to this point is he's been ha he's had the ability to stack practice days to really get acclimated into the offense. And I think that's been beneficial to him because he was limited in the, in the yeah. spring. Um, so I think to develop that continued chemistry with Joe Milton, to, to do it in 11-on-11 11 11 work, you know, to do it in 7-on-7 seven seven type stuff, more than just the summer throwing sessions, to do it, you know, in gear, on the practice field, to do it back-to-back -back days, multiple days in a row, I, I think was important for Dante Thornton. And so I, I think you're seeing right there, I mean, he's a smooth athlete who can do a lot of different things and um, I, I'm impressed with just the way he takes coaching. I mean, he, he's still a young receiver, but boy, he is a, he's a guy who's always learned, seems like he's always learning, having a conversation with Ramel or, um, you know, with Kelsey Pope about cleaning up some little things or Josh Heupel about just some little things there. Um, seems very, wants to really improve technically, seems really dialed into that part right now. So we look at the defense now, and already spoke a little bit about the defensive line, uh, the options, the quality of depth. We've all spoke about linebackers and how that room just looks different, about how Brian John Marie should probably be the most excited assistant coach on staff right now because he has some options and some of these young guys look good. What about that secondary? A lot of questions there. Not going to have answers after scrimmage number one. Not going to have answers here on a Tuesday. But also, when you look at that secondary and kind of the start of fall camp, what have you heard? What have you seen about a lot of guys returning? You've added some bodies in there, but for a unit that absolutely has to take a step. Well, they do. Um, the question is, is kind of like, what's the combination going to be? And and when do they start really pushing guys at certain spots to see if they can play this position or that position? Uh, they have a lot of bodies at corner and a lot of bodies at safety. And, you know, the question is, is, you know, do they kind of just roll with the veterans? Do they – let some of these young guys push to the point where, like, you know, they might push the veteran right on out. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated to kind of see how that back end of the defense works and what it looks like come, you know, game three at Florida or game four against UTSA. I just think that maybe not for the Virginia opener, but, again, Tennessee I think has got to, you know, look at some different combinations in fall camp. They clearly are. You know, they're going to, you know, put Gabe Judy Lolly at, 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 you know, at, at star some. They're going to put Warren Burrell at star some and see if either one of those guys can can handle that spot. If that's the case, then that allows them to move T-Mac back to safety, get a little more athletic in the back end, and it gives T-Mac more versatility on tape for the NFL. Um, you know, I, I think there's some real pros there um, with the amount of bodies they have, but ultimately you, you've got to kind of, you know, to, to see it happen before you can actually believe it's going to happen. Well, and T-Mac was limited on Monday, a um, little bit of a precautionary nagging thing he's dealing with right now with, with a muscle deal, which is opening the door for Burrell and, and Judy Lawley. It's one thing to talk about doing those things, but when you're down, uh, the guy who started every game for you at that position last year, this forces you to, to move guys around and give those guys more reps. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. I, I want to say this quickly, but – we get back to the secondary. I will say this about Brian Jean Marie. Um, you saw what happened with with Juwan Mitchell getting dismissed already at Arizona State. Uh, we've seen Jeremy Banks already out of the NFL, released by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, the management that that Brian Jean Marie did the last couple of years at that position to to, to create some depth with some guys. Um, who most of us didn't think were going to be real factors uh, to get them on the field, and then to manage two guys who clearly were, quite frankly, a, a challenge to manage. I don't know that Brian Jean-Marie gets near enough credit for the production he got out of that room uh, with what he had to manage and deal with. So a, a big shout-out to, to him. I, I think he is one of the best assistant coaches on the staff and is probably – underrated by a lot of fans out there because they don't really look at it that way. But I think he's had a he, – he's done a terrific job since he's been here. He's got more to work with now, so he's having a little more enjoyable time out there uh, on the practice field. But but to manufacture the production he did out of the linebacker position the last two years 
uh, was 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 really really pretty incredible to be honest with you. Would you say that linebacker room's as scary as this thunder that's probably coming through my microphone right now? Uh, they're pretty <laughs> talented. Now you know here's the thing about the linebackers: Arian Carter's got all the talent in the world, uh, but but he's still got to figure out. You know, don't take the false step. Take the right step. Know where you're going to be all the time. There's still a mental. I mean, physically, he's as gifted as you'll see. Same with Jeremiah T. Lander. There, there's still a learning and adjustment to the speed of, of, of this game when you get into 11-on-11 11 11 work. To me, the most encouraging thing out of the linebacker position to this point, I think from, from feedback you hear, Austin, and from kind of watching, I, I think six more months removed from the ACL injury for Keenan Peely has been six more quality months for Keenan Peely, not just a bruiser down in the box, slamming up into the hole in the run game type guy. I think he's got some of that lateral movement back that you're looking for him to have because mentally he understands playing in space. It's about physically. Can you get there? I think he's better than he was in the spring, Austin. Well, you, you, you go back two years ago, Ronald Acuna tears the ACL. Last year was a shell of what he normally is. This year, back to the same old Ronald Acuna. See, I'm talking Braves baseball. This year, you're hoping that that's what happens with Peely. Because a year ago, Peely was kind of hampered, slowed a little bit, um, and then had an ankle on top of that. And so, you know, you're hoping that that year two post-ACL for Peely is when he kind of gets back to himself again has drawn some praise out there on the practice field, has drawn the eye of a few NFL scouts who have been in to watch practice. Um, you know, so you, you, you took him because he's a veteran. You took him because he's super smart. If all of a sudden he's back to his old self, this could end up being a great six-month steal for Tennessee. Well, and Eric, you and I watched that that blitz pickup drill that they did on Thursday or Friday – um, and it was – you could see the experience there, right? Some of those young kids, not just the freshmen, but even some of those sophomores off the edge, it was head down just a million miles an hour to the first thing that, that you collided with. He was setting backs and tight ends up on his blood stuff. He, he, was, he was working some pass rush moves a little bit, if you will. You could tell he had done that, and he had very a lot more experience that than some of those other guys who were just – you know, bull in a china shop, head down, just going as hard as they could go. You know that inflatable arm man that's in the you know car dealerships out there that are flailing around? That's what some of those young guys <laughs> look like coming off the edge. But with Keenan Peely, he was playing chess. He was doing he was doing one thing, setting up his move for a split seconds later, you know, inside jazz so we can spin around, you know, whatever, swim move, uh, you know, duck and rip. It, it was fun to watch, and, and yeah, you're right. You can just see that. He's been doing this for five, six. I mean, he's been doing this a long time, and I think that could be a benefit for Tennessee. Took, so took you, took you back to when you were doing that at a Carson Newman on Monday. Oh, I mean, it was pretty much like watching the same tape, right? <laughs> I mean, I look just like him too. So. I thought he, I thought Eric was going to step out there and start clinicking for him and tell him what to do, just sort of take over the drill. I yeah. offered, I offered for BJ, but he said he had it. So I was like, all right, if you got it, you got it. Plenty of fun stuff going on at Tennessee Fall Camp right now. Week number two is ongoing. Scrimmage number one is going to be on Thursday, and that will be a big one. And, of course, we'll evaluate it and have the best notes right here at VolQuest.com. want to give a quick shout-out to Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events or shows shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all your sports, music, comedy, theater near you with killer deals on last-minute tickets with their best price guarantee you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped up for the fun that you're going to have here at Tennessee football games this fall uh, when you download the app okay flash deals make last minute purchasing super easy easy to find and buy tickets for every event in your area including football right here at Neyland Stadium you can see your seats before purchasing as well that's a big thing over at game time on the app and the lowest price guaranteed event cancellation protection and lo job loss protection as well. Just some of the benefits that you're going to get by downloading that app and buying your tickets over at game time. It makes last minute purchasing just a breeze. All right. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has got deals, tickets right up to the day of the event. 
exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, theater, whatever the case is, you can find them there. Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference as well if you have a seat that, uh, that, that, that goes missing right before the, the day of the game. So a lot of great stuff over at Game Time right now. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the promo code VOLS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, go ahead and create an account. Redeem code VOLS for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. That is GameTime.co or download the app Game Time today. And as always, a big thank you to our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, for making this podcast coverage possible. Nominate a family that you think is deserving of the Exterior Home Makeover. A gift from your friends at Exterior Home Solutions. So as fall camp rolls on, the first edition of the USA Today's Coaches Poll was debuted on Monday afternoon. Tennessee comes in ranked number 10 in the country. Brent Hubbs, is that too high, too low, or just about right heading into the season for the Coaches Poll? Well, I, I mean, I think the – I'm not surprised where the SIDs put Tennessee heading into uh, the, the start of the season in, in the Coaches Poll. I'm not sure how many coaches voted during fall camp for where teams should be. But, you know, when you bring back a quarterback, uh, you bring back an offense that was as good as it was, and, and Tennessee's bringing back um, a handful of starters on the on the defense, uh, uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, you know, I, I think it makes I think it makes some sense. You know, a lot of Tennessee fans surprised Clemson's a spot ahead because the last time those two teams played, T Tennessee obviously handled Clemson. They did it without Tennessee did it without Hendon Hooker. They did it with basically the team that is coming back with the exception of, of two offensive linemen. So um, now I'm not surprised they're in the top 10 but personally. I, I mean, I think that's kind of a given Austin when a team finishes on an uptick the previous year, a lot of people just look at that. I'm not, I'm not sure a lot of people sat around and, and broke down the, you know, the, the analysis of each team like Rob did in his previews in, in July to say, okay, this team's got this coming back. It's just, hey, the last time we've been looking at team. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you go back two years ago, Ole Miss was really good with Matt Corral. Then last year, they were preseason top ten. Why? Because what they had done the year before and, and, and going to the Sugar Bowl and so on, so on and so forth. Um, so I'm not surprised where Tennessee's at. I think they're a touch too high for my liking. I think there's still some questions. Uh, but, I mean, I don't think it really matters. You're going to play it out on the field, and, you know, a lot of this stuff will start, you know, shaking itself out, you know, and right out of the gate when Florida State plays LSU, and that's two top ten teams that are ahead of Tennessee. And, you know, you're just going to go out and, and play games. I, again, I think that, you know, Tennessee should probably be somewhere between 12 and 16. And, you know, and I know Tennessee fans will get all bit out of shape about that. I'm just What saying, a I'm, hater. What a hater, I think. It's not, I just feel like there's a lot of questions. I don't think that – I think the offensive line is a major question mark. We'll find out if they're able to be up to the, you know, the test. I think Joe's got to go out and prove it. Um, you know, and, and on a weekly, consistent basis. Uh, I, I've said all offseason, I think that this offense is going to take maybe a, a fraction of a touch step back, and I think that the defense is going to take a huge step forward. So I think ultimately it, Tennessee has a chance to be just as good. I just think it may look a fraction different than it was a year ago. I think what's interesting, Eric and, and Rob, big picture when you look at it, is you got a couple schools up there in the, in the top five, top eight, that are that are they're unproven at quarterback. Traditionally, quarterback carries you in your rankings, right? Okay, we know what USC's got at quarterback. We know Florida State's bringing back a starter. We know where LSU is. Alabama unproven at the quarterback position, but still getting the love, I think, because they're Alabama. Georgia, rightfully so. I mean, Georgia's got – they're a machine. They're bringing a bunch of people back. They've had quarterbacks waiting in the wing. But I'm a little surprised a couple of those schools without proven commodities at quarterback – are ranked as, you know, I guess as high as they are. Particularly Alabama jumps out to me. Well, Ohio, Ohio State, too. I mean, you lost, you know, the second, yeah. you know, second, the second the quarterback draft. off the board. Yeah. So I'm a little surprised those two. I mean, I think that's just based on the history of what they've done um, the, the last few years, Rob, that, that you just, you know, again, I, I, I don't think a lot of people put a ton of thought into this. No, things, absolutely. Which, I mean, I, I think they look, you know, I'm not saying that, they don't look at anything, but I, I don't think they're looking, you know, who, what, what transfers are, you know, come in, in the two deep or, you know, what, what do they have? What's, you know, what's the depth at linebacker look like that kind of, I, I'm, I think they look at, you know, Georgia, Michigan, Alabama, Ohio state have been stacking top five recruiting classes on top of one another for years. And, uh, 
and, and you're right. I mean, they, they do bring a lot back at, at most of those places, but quarterback, you know, not not one of them um, for those three teams that were in the playoffs last year. And, you know, I, I'm i a little bit – you know, I, I know they're good and I know they finished super strong. I'm a little surprised at the, all the LSU love. I mean, fifth, I don't, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, not, I wouldn't fight somebody over it, but that would seem pretty high. Yeah, I think the thing about LSU, Austin, is, is the fact they're bringing back the Daniels kid at quarterback, and they were really young on the offensive line a year ago. It was freshmen learning baptism by fire. So a lot of people think they're going to take a big step in the offensive front this year because of, you know, what those guys had to learn on the job. But, I mean, they did lose some quality players on, on the defensive side of the ball as well. I, that one's a little bit surprising. I'm, I'm surprised Oklahoma's in the top 22 with the way that they played last year, AP. That one, that one kind of surprises me overall. Yeah, I mean, the Oklahoma surprises me. Nothing really – I mean, like, you look at the top ten, nothing surprises me there. Washington with Phoenix is, is, is I think, really, really going to be really good. Ewers with Texas, Notre Dame's Notre Dame. Utah's got so much, you know, with Rising coming back for his 43rd year there and, and you know, with, with the Utes. Oregon, ton of talent, younger team a year ago plus Bo Nix. Uh, TCU going to reload a little bit. Um, but yeah, Oklahoma stands out and, and Ole Miss. I mean, I love Judkins at running back, but you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of question marks there. Um, and then Wisconsin for that matter. I mean, with, you know, when Fickle's first year, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated to kind of see what they do. And, uh, so, I mean, like, I, I, you know, could you re-rank them a, a little bit here and there? Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of teams, you know, feel pretty good about where they're at heading into the season that are in that top 25. Yeah. I think what a, what a, go ahead, my go biggest ahead. Surprise, I mean, just in the league is, is, and I think it's funny is Texas A&M. I mean, just because of the, you know, the way that, that last year went for them. I mean, yeah, they've got a bunch of talent. They've been recruiting well, you know, obviously Jimbo is, is proven, but just the, the, the circus that that thing was last year for, uh, for them to, to be in, in the top 25 preseason. I, I think that tells you a lot about, you know, kind of this SEC respect and what Hubbard was talking about. People, I don't think, did a ton of research. Yeah, I mean, you know, can they find good quarterback play? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, and again, that's what happens with top 25 polls. I mean, I, I think I mean, you look at the top four teams where they're, they're the playoff teams, right? I mean, pretty much. So, I mean, some of that's just kind of a given, okay, we're putting those guys there. And again, no coach is sitting down diving into that thing. They got recruiting going on at the end of January. They got they. I mean, most coaches have no idea where they voted somebody um, because they didn't participate in it. They're, whoever their assistant is threw that thing together and went, "Hey, coach, you good with this?" Dude, yeah, whatever. Let, let's go I figure bet, out if we can convert third and four. However, I bet you, but maybe not the only times. I bet a large percentage of the times that a, that a head coach knows who he voted for or where he voted is when he voted somebody out of spite lower than, than they should have been. Yeah. And, 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 and you see, and you might see that from time to time for, for sure. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how it, how it all shakes out. It's talking points. It's fun. Um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of go from, go from there and, and see what this thing turns into. Unless I miss somebody and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's pretty light in terms of teams. Tennessee will play. That's on the initial top 25 coaches. It's only three, isn't it? Georgia, Alabama, A&M. That's right. When you look at it, I mean, it's Tennessee's toughest three games. That's why I said they got to go out and prove it. I mean, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with being ranked, you know, outside the top ten in the preseason. Preseason polls, are, they, they don't matter. Like, you go out and you you run the table in September, heading to October, heading into that A&M game off the bye week. Nobody's going to care if you were ranked preseason ranked 25th for A&M or 10th for Tennessee or – fourth for Ohio State, it doesn't matter. Like, you're just going to go out and win games and try to, you know, fix where you feel like you're weak and improve where you feel like you're strong. Yeah, no doubt. And and so we'll see how all that plays out, you know, moving forward. A lot of people thought maybe UTSA was going to sneak in there in the top 25. I didn't think they would be there, but I do think that's a good team. So we'll see how that goes. As we wrap this thing up, I'm going to circle back around um, and ask this question to you guys. Who who is the buzz? Who's the buzz, or what's the buzz position? What? Let me rephrase that. Who is the buzz on Friday, Thursday afternoon, Friday after the scrimmage? What's going to be? You think that the takeaway narrative coming out of the scrimmage on Thursday? Uh, AP, I'll start with you. Uh, I'm going to go Cam Selden. I think he's going to make some plays. Um, 
you know, again, I still would have him probably fourth behind the, the three older guys, but I, I think you'll hear his name talked about. I think you'll hear a lot about the defensive line. Um, and, and so I think you'll hear some talk about, you know, Tyler Barron, uh, some of those young guys, uh, Omar Norman Lott. And, uh, and then I think you'll hear more talk about Beasley and Peely. Rob, do you need to hear more um, about where Tennessee's at offensive tackle the right way, or do you want to hear more about what James Pierce, Joshua Joseph, Caleb Harib's doing off the edge? We'll see. Hubbard, it's a catch twenty-two. You know. But, uh, oh, but don't I, sound like a coach. Come no, on. No, I think if I'm a coach, I'm if I'm a Tennessee coach, I would, and, and this is long term. I would rather have those young pass rushers flash somebody. You know, not, not you know, you don't want them to dominate at all, but you'd like for you know, Joseph's or Pierce or, 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 you know, West or one of those guys to, to flash enough to where, you know, they were, they were being disruptive, you know, not so much that you're like, Oh my God, what are we going to do at left tackle? Obviously. But to me, just with the question marks that with the pass rush with, you know, Byron Young and, and those seven sacks gone, I mean, who's going to step up? I think that's a bigger concern because as you were saying earlier with LRB, I mean, they, they managed to field, you know, decent offensive lines historically, but, you know, pass rush. I mean, I'm, you can, I don't want to say you can't coach it, but so much of that, you know, is about you, you just gotta have dudes. And you know, and does Tennessee have dudes there? Yep. Du- dudes make a difference at that spot more than anywhere. I mean, you know, can you get there? You can technique a little bit of it, but you got the bend, you have the natural ability to get there. So we'll see. Rodney Garner said coming out of spring, somebody need to take and run with it. But we'll see if anybody runs at that spot, uh come start to run at that spot a little bit on Thursday. Again, scrimmage one. Um, you know, nobody's in a total panic about anything that happens there, but it is the start to answer some questions. As Glenn Ellerby said on Monday, this is when you start to figure out where you are on the offensive line, kind of what your five is going to look like, start to move towards uh, finding those five, settling in a little bit to develop some continuity. So we'll see if they get there coming out of uh, whatever they do on Thursday, and then we'll see if this defensive uh, front lives up to kind of the billing they produced for themselves here the first week, week and a half of fall camp. We'll see. Should be interesting to see. We'll have plenty of conversation about that on the General's Quarters. We're going to have plenty of uh, news to read about, plenty of stories, videos, all kinds of things out there for you as our camp coverage continues to roll right along. Be sure and jump on YouTube and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit 500 likes on this podcast, and we thank you for your support there and continue to give us uh, your support at VolQuest.com. We certainly appreciate that. We'll talk to you on the General's Quarters, and we'll talk to you on Thursday for the Mailbag Podcast. That's going to do it for this edition of the Tuesday Podcast, presented by our good friends at Exterior Home Solutions. For Eric Kane, Rob Lewis, and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody. 